Good morning and welcome to a look at customer privacy and a few of the laws in Australia that re respond to that. So you've got the, the Spam Act, the Privacy Act, the Privacy Principles. We took a very brief look at those, but the main point of today is to look at how to apply those to the way that you're handling your customers' private details. My name is Dante St. James. Um, we're going live right now on Zoom. So if you are on the Zoom call live, there's a few of you, please do make use of the webinar chat and the Q&A section so you can ask some questions. I'll be able to answer those live for you. If you're watching this on YouTube later on, please do leave any comments down below um, so we can answer those when we get a chance to. That does alert us and let us know there's answers to be made. Um, and you can see this on either YouTube under my name. Um, it's youtube.com forward slash at Dante St. James or through Business Station, youtube.com forward slash at Business Station. With that out of the way, let's share that screen and let's get underway. What we're going to look at today is what data is protected under Australian law? We're looking at specifically Commonwealth laws, not state laws. They tend to line up with the uh, Australian laws on this kind of thing anyway. Uh, the impact on list building. Uh, so it's a, if you're building a list of email addresses or a list of uh, SMS numbers and that sort of thing to be able to do marketing towards or go, cover on what the impact of that happens to be and what you've got to do to make sure you're doing it the right way. We look at what spam is and how that differs from customer contact messages. So there's a subtle differences in there. This, this whole webinar shouldn't take long because there's not a lot to these laws, but the consequences of not knowing them can often be a little bit scary. So hopefully we'll be able to avoid that with you and get you in a place where you're building the right lists in the right way and you're doing the right thing about your customer's personally identifiable information. This is brought to you by Business Station and the Digital Solutions Program, thanks to the Australian government. A bit about me and my background. Um, I've worked in a lot of areas uh, as a certified lead trainer with Meta. There's about five of us in Australia. The Digital Solutions Program. I work as an entrepreneurship facilitator for Workforce Australia's self-employment services, Australian government's Be Connected program, Google's Digital Springboard program. I've done it all. I've done a lot of Privacy Act training and Spam Act training back when it came about in 2003 as well, as well as the most recent updates to the uh, Privacy Act, uh, the, sorry, the National Privacy Principle which came about in as, as, as recently as November last year. So it's something which I make very, I've got a very, very big email list. So it's very, very important for me to be able to stay on top of these things myself, which is why I'm able to share them with you as well. So what data is actually protected? That's a, that's a great question to ask because there's three pieces of legislation that tell us what that is. And they're related to our customers' data in these ways. You've got the Privacy Act of 1988, which is a Commonwealth law. That's what the CTH means at the end of any laws you see. Uh, this means Commonwealth. Australian Privacy Principles of 2017, which is also a Commonwealth one, which is an extension of the Privacy Act of 1988. So it started off, they've had a few amendments along the way. The most recent amendment um, was in November last year. And then the Spam Act of 2003, which is also another Commonwealth one. So another fairly recent addition to Australian law, reflecting that um, your spam is a fairly out of control thing. So the Privacy Act of 1988 is all about applying to government agencies and corporations of over $3 million in turnover. You and I probably aren't going to be impacted by this one. It's a lot to do with um, the, the reporting of breaches that go on. So remember what happened to Medibank and to Optus in the most recent cases, um, lots of other places, LastPass, which is my password manager, got impacted by this as well. So there's lots of different ways that, they, uh, that the government says that, that, that businesses who are large need to react to when things happen to customers' details. If the database is compromised and copied by hackers, then you need to let the government know in a timely fashion that this happened. So then the Australian Cyber Security Center can respond to that. Now, you and I don't have businesses over $3 million. Well, I'm assuming that you and I don't have businesses over $3 million. So this may not apply to us, but the more recent amendments to the Act do. And that's where we talk about the national privacy principles. Um, what happened with the Privacy Act is that an Office of the Australian Information Commissioner was formed as a way of overseeing and enforcing these laws. So the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner is often the legal arm of the Act. And it goes and basically 
make sure that you know places like Medibank and Optus um, are readily chastised and fined um, for any sort of breaches and 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 ways that they haven't looked after their customers' private data. Again, though, we don't probably fall into that one, but there has been a lot of amendments um, and of the November 2022 updates were very much in response to what happened with Medibank and with Optus. It's since been superseded by the Australian Privacy Principles or National Privacy Principles in 2018. And what these manage to do is handle more of the stuff which is now for you and I, for everyday businesses, not just for businesses with over $3 million. And they really ask us to ask a few questions of ourselves and the way we're doing business and the way that we're handling customer data. The first question is, do I really need this information? Now, quite often I go to a website to buy something and they ask me for my full address um, as a part of saying, this is, needs to be, I need a billing address to be able to, um, you know, to, to be able to um, identify me for my payment on my credit card. Now, the only thing that is needed for a credit card to be able to be used is a, uh, a state and a postcode. Now, they don't need any other verification. They don't need the full address. Getting your full address is another way of just adding more complexity to their database so they can perhaps send you mail. Um, they don't need that mail, but they will use it to sort of create uh, you know, location data that gives them an idea of where all their customers are. So they can see clusters of where they may be and they go, oh, we've got lots of them in this suburb, but not very many in this suburb. They don't actually need that data. Um, it's not necessary for them for their business activities, but they can argue that that data reasonably is necessary for one of more of their other functions or activities. So maybe not for the purchase of the product you make at the website, but they can argue that, oh, it's to do with you know, our, our market research activities. It's necessary for that. And that's how they tend to get away with it when they ask those questions. But the credit card payment process doesn't need your full address. It just doesn't need that to validate your credit card payment. It just needs a postcode, really. That's all it really needs to say, oh yeah, this is the person that we need to match with. So it gets um, a little bit more. Um, can we not add unnecessary information? Yeah, the problem is though that um, those companies don't give you the option. They just say they must collect all this and they argue that it's because of one of their other functions or activities of their business. So that's the, you know, that's the unfortunate side of it is that they go, well, I've got some other thing. We've got market research activities we do which require this. Or we might go for, to, to provide a better service to our customers, um, we need this information. So they've always got a way to sort of argue around why they would need extra answers. So great question, Jan. Thank you very much for asking that. So yeah, ask yourself, what information do you really need? Now, the reason why you as a small business would ask what information you need is probably because you don't have market research teams. You don't have great big data repositories that you're doing comparative analysis of different databases and, and trying to look at where people are or where people aren't. You just basically might want to know, are they in Australia? Are they in a state of Australia? So think about why you would need that information rather than just demanding that everybody tells you everything about them just because that makes you feel like you should. And quite a lot of, um, you know, a lot of business coaches, a lot of digital coaches, they're like, oh, get all the information you can, you know, because the more you know about your customer, the more you can personalize things. But the reality is you're a small business. It's probably just you working in the business in most cases. You don't have the time or the functions or necessarily want to have the time or the functions to be able to pick up that information and work with it. So just, just ask for what you really, really need to use and try and not go beyond that. Because the more information you have, the more attractive your database is to hackers once it's known that you've got that information. The next thing is to ask if you've informed the customer of what is being collected and why. Now, this is... This, this again, is, a, is another repercussion of, do I really need to ask them this, this, these questions? The more, the more that you collect, the more you have to explain why you collect it. So if you're saying, I need um, your mother's maiden name, I need the last three places you lived in, and this is why. So let's say you're putting in a rental application. This applies as well. So the rental application may say, we need the last three places you lived at. And they'll say, and the reason we need this is because we need to verify that there's no outstanding rentals or problems with those properties you previously lived in. They can adequately explain why they need to collect that. So the customer must know who is collecting it. So it's either you or your business. So probably going to be your business that explains that. You don't necessarily have to put your name on that. 
unless your name is your business and you put your name on it. The customer must know who that is, who, who it is that's collecting it, and how to contact you if they've got questions about the data that's being collected and that they can access that information when they demand it. So this is a very big part of the national privacy principles or the Australian privacy principles is that if you collect data on people, they can ask you to know what data you hold and then you send them something to let them know. So for instance, so it could be a package of data, it could be an email, it could be a Word document that says, this is all the data that we hold on you. And then you go, they go, okay, great, I know that. Or if you're not holding that stuff at all, then you just go, well, probably need, need to um, not include that data at all. Um, and to so say, hey, we don't hold any data on you at all. So an honest answer is good. Um, there's no real sort of time limit where you have to reply within 24 hours. What I what I do as a, as a as a general principle with the companies that I do some work with is I say to them, look, what you do is respond within 24 hours and then commit to a time when they will have that data. Now that data can be um, sent via email. It can be sent via SMS. It can be sent via instant message. It can be sent via mail. You can you send it as a postage thing. And if it does cost you money to send them that information, you actually do have the right to charge them for that. So you can say it's going to cost you $35 to receive that information. Um, particularly, and then this would be like particularly if you have to pay people to go and extract that out of a database. In your case, it's really just going to be something in MailChimp or it's going to be something on your website where you've collected details or in your email program or somewhere on, on your customer relationship management database. Uh, you shouldn't really need to go to cost. It'll just be a matter of, okay, here's a screen shot of what we have in our customer relationship management database. Now, this information isn't just name, address, email, postcode, phone number. Um, it can also be things like the notes that you've got about them. So your notes that you keep in your CRM are not private just for you. They are also able to be demanded legally by the person who's asking. So it's a person that you've written about. So let's just say it's um, it's um, John Smith. And John Smith, um, you've written some stuff in there saying John's been particularly nasty today. Um, he's asking questions in a very aggressive manner. That information can be requested and, and 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 it is part of their personal information so if you do have extensive notes about your clients when you do have to provide those no, that, that that privacy information back to them you say we hold this information on you including all these notes so that's that's a little bit of a trick so it makes you think you know before you go writing nasty things about your clients in your crm it might be a good idea to think about that first because you never know quite when they might say if they're a particularly nasty client they go okay i demand to see everything every piece of data that you hold about me and you go oh yeah okay yeah i hold a lot of data about you that's not very nice it might not be a very pleasant experience and trust me if someone who's um a nasty customer is probably the person who's going to demand access to their the information you hold about them more readily than someone who's happy with you. Someone who's happy with you won't even need to do that, but there'll be someone, it always just, it always happens to be someone who's got a problem with you or your company. So just make sure you make it clear who it is, who's collecting it, how they can contact you, and um, that they can access that information when required. You've actually got to say that you, you can, may require this in your privacy policy on your website. You can explain all this stuff. So you don't need to explain this in every email you send out. You just put it in your privacy policy. Make sure that privacy policy is easy to find on your website, not hidden away under 13 levels of menus. And, and it's, it's appearing on one page. It's not linked anywhere. You've got to have it so it's findable from the front page of the website. It doesn't have to be on the front page. It just has to be findable from the front page of the website. Next up, am I sharing this data with anyone else? The customer must know if you intend to or do or may plan to in the future share this information with third parties and why you need to share it with third parties. So for example, if someone's entering in their information to a MailChimp form, that information is not just going to you, it's also going to MailChimp. So your privacy policy should have enough of a, um, of a, of a, of a buffer in it that allows you to say, yes, it is coming to us. But because we use third-party systems like cookies on a website, which may track the fact that you're visiting us through Google or that um, you might click on something from Facebook and it will track the fact that you, you your identifiable account is on Facebook and that I also happen to... Um, 
you know, also share this data with um, this my, my third party call center in the Philippines, my virtual assistant who is not part of my business, but is a contractor. You don't have to explain in that much detail. But what you would say is that you do work with third parties who assist you um, with virtual um, office and virtual assistance functions um, and that um, any information they have is um, limited to your systems. They do not hold this information in their system. So that all comes down to a lot of uh, the, the agreements and the contracts you make with your virtual assistants in other places. So it's very, it's very worth knowing that you do have to do these checks and balances with people you work with who are outside of your immediate business. Anyone within your business is covered under you as well. But once you start using people who are contractors, once you start using third-party companies, once you start using tools and services which collect this data and, and may use it for some sort of purpose other than um, serving you as the client, well, then you have to explain these in your privacy policy. Writing a privacy policy is, um, is a fairly common thing to do these days. Um, you typically haven't needed one until you have that $3 million of revenue, uh, but it's a good pro it's a good practice to have it in place on your website anyway, because if you try to advertise on Facebook, advertise on Google, you want to go through any sort of, um, you know, any sort of uh, services through Google that you want to operate that are advertising or otherwise to do with our commerce manager, um, marketplace kind of things, then they're going to require that you have a privacy policy, usually a terms of service and a returns policy in the case of e-commerce. So having these policies, even though it's not legally required to have one until you've reached that $3 million of turnover, you still should have one. Like friends, I've got them. I haven't reached $3 million yet, but I have them anyway because they're good practice and having them says a lot more about you. Well, actually not having them says a lot about you that you don't want to have said about you. If you don't have one, it'd be the, the equivalent of saying, well, um, I'm a bit dodgy. Uh, like I, I chose not to have one because I'm a little bit dodgy I, I, or I don't know what I'm doing. And it sort of singles you out by someone who may have a problem with you at some point. They go, oh, you don't have a privacy policy. What, what have you got? What data have you got about me? You need to share that with me. And you have someone then being the smarty pants law expert that they currently are because they've um, got in touch with Google. And that's how that moves on. It becomes a bit of a mess. So the customer must know that you will share this information with third parties if you're going to and why you need to share it with them. Another question to ask is, is it legal to collect this information? There's certain information which, unless it's required by law or they have expressly consented to providing this information that you can't hold. So you can't make assumptions about people's health, political opinions, religious beliefs or sexual orientation without them expressing specifically that they approve of you holding that information. So even if you write something in your, your notes which says, um, you know, Janice is, is, is a lesbian um, who happens to also be a Mormon and has very um, far right wing political opinions, you actually can't hold that information in your system legally unless they've actually expressed that it's okay for you to have that in their system. So personally identifiable information, especially about things like health, which has massive repercussions with things like health insurance. In case you haven't noticed, health insurance companies are absolutely unscrupulous when it comes to not paying out on things if they can, especially when they think, well, they think are uh, pre-existing conditions that you may not even know about. Um, political opinions, there's a very big reason for people to discriminate. Um, obviously, religious beliefs is an area where people discriminate and sexual orientation, that kind of goes without saying. So you need to not hold this information unless it's absolutely vital for what you do, unless you're a health provider or you're working in the area of health well-being, where knowing a bit about someone's health is important to you, you do need to disclose at the point of collecting that, that this is why I'm collecting this. I need this for this reason. So it could be for diagnosis as a naturopath or a chiropractor saying, I need to know these things up front so that I can provide a safer, more um, holistic health service to you. So just be very clear on that. This information is not necessary unless you work in areas where it is necessary. The next question you ask is, can I commit to keeping this information accurate? Um, this is really straight. It's not up to the customer to keep their information with you accurate. It's up to you to keep it accurate. This is why, for instance, every time you go to a doctor, 
or every time you go to um, like a government office, they'll say, hey, is this still is this still your address? You're still at this address? You still got this phone number? Because they actually have a legal responsibility to ensure that the information in their database is correct and up to date. Now, you may not give them that information. You may not give them the truth. They, they're not responsible for what you tell them. They just have to actually ask the question and update it. So for instance, I went to... Um, Went to, where did I go to yesterday? I went to, um, oh, the optometrist yesterday. So the optometrist, I went to Spec Savers. And Spec Savers, the first question they asked me, oh, yeah, good, good to see you again, Dante. Um, so this is still your phone number. This is still your address. Yep. And I changed my address because I had moved. And that's because they need to keep that information complete, up to date, and accurate. So it's up to them to do that, not up to you to tell them, but it's up to them to at least ask the question. So you need to do that. If you're collecting information on people, it's up to you to make that stuff um, up to date and accurate. I don't know why that's in the act because it's to me it doesn't make much sense why you need to be responsible for that. But I suppose what it is is that if there's a history of things like addresses and phone numbers, um, that someone who steals that information can then reverse engineer to find people's histories and that sort of thing. So I guess that's that's as part of protecting um, people from when things happen in cyber leaks and cyber breaches and attacks. Ask yourself, how am I collecting this information? You cannot require that people provide personal information for reasons that are unfair. So for instance, you must provide me with um, what your political affiliation is in order for you to participate in this giveaway. You can't do that. That's that's actually number one. It opens you up to many anti-discrimination problems. And secondly, it is an unfair question to ask. Nobody should have to share such a personal piece of information in order to enter a giveaway for a for a scented candle. That's not fair and it's certainly not reasonable. It's also can't be intrusive. And by being intrusive, it's asking questions that are very, very um deeply personal. So you may ask, in order to um, provide you with a better service as a copywriter, um, I'm going to ask you what, what it was like for you when you were a child growing up. That would be considered to be an intrusive question because it's not related to the service of copywriting. Now, if you are a neurolinguistic programming uh, therapist, an NLP hypnotherapist, someone like that, then it might be important for you to know that. That would not be then intrusive. But if you need to ask those questions and leave them in the customer file, it needs to be, yes, relevant to what you do, but you also then have to have their express signed um, permission for you to collect that data. So in your, your, your sign-on process as a, as a therapist, you would then have someone fill out their form and they would say, in order to provide that service, we'll ask you a number of personal questions about your life, your childhood, and some of your experiences. This is in order for us to be able to better work with you know, overcoming any trauma or any things that you want to overcome as part of our session. Do you agree to this? Now, sign it and agree it and sign it and date it. That's, I know it seems really complex, but most of this stuff is fairly common sense. If you're going to hold lots of information about people, particularly personally identifying information and things like health information, information about their sex lives, information about their, their personal lives, their growing up, their background, their history, then you need to make sure that the customer knows that you hold that information and why you're holding that information. So hopefully that makes sense. Do you still need this information? You might have changed your style of business and that says to you now that you don't really need that information anymore um, because it's not part of your business. Uh, that client is no longer part of what you do. Um, you completely changed direction, started something, a completely different line of business that has nothing to do with what you did before. You got to ask yourself, if you don't need that information, then why are you holding on to it? Um, if it's no longer needed, that information should be destroyed, deleted, and should be at least, if you don't destroy it, de-identified. What de-identified means is that while she may hold aggregate data that says um, 13 people in my customer list identify as LGBTIQA+, you can't say who those people are. You can't have a record of those people being specifically related to that tag of LGBTIQA+. So then it, it takes away the identifiable information of those people, but you can still hold data that says 13 people you've dealt with were of that kind of, that kind of life. So you can hold that, but you can't hold who those 13 people are, if that makes sense. So you can delete the identifiable part, but then you can keep the, the aggregate data. So the, you know, that, um, 
you know, that, that, that you have 28% of people or you got a record of having served 28 people who have a uh, left-leaning political philosophy. Uh, again, you can have that information. You just can't have the people who are in that information. You have to remove the record of the person, but you can keep a record that says that a person had that affiliation. Well, the easiest thing is to do, of course, is destroy that information because you don't need it. You're not going to need that information going into whatever your new business or enterprise is. Play it safe. Just get rid of the information. Now, there's certain um, areas where this doesn't count. So, for instance, if you're working in uh, financial planning, financial um, advice, accounting, bookkeeping, and all that, there's certain uh, record keeping requirements that, that you know need them for at least five or seven years in some cases. Then that overrides this that you will need to keep that information in there. But if you are working with a financial planning, um, if you're a financial planner, you're an accountant, you're a bookkeeper you're not going to have sensitive information about those clients. You're not going to have whether they're gay or lesbian or whether they're red, yellow, black and white or whether they like um, they like to hang out with pink unicorns and purple polka dots on the weekend. That kind of really sensitive information isn't required for what you do. So you wouldn't have that in the first place. So the record keeping may require you to have that client's details against their name, but then the kind of data you got about them isn't going to be anything that's sensitive apart from the fact of what their login to zero is, which again, you don't have that login. You have your own login to zero where you can access their data. So it, it's, it's a bit of a balancing act of trying to work out whether you need to keep that data or not and what kind of data you need to keep. But if you do need to keep the data and it's of a very personal nature, it's quite in-depth, you need to de-identify it. Um, you need to you know, scramble it away so that, that no one can tell who that person was if they stole the data. So yeah, that's a very strong principle. Now that's when you look at whether there's any special requirements for your particular industry, because some industries do have different requirements, usually around finance. Usually finance and sometimes health will have particular um, record keeping requirements. Uh, it's usually only if you're in the sort of the medical establishment, uh, not so if you're like a, a therapist or you're a um, NLP practitioner or a well-being consultant or nutritionist, you may not necessarily need to hold those records because you're not in what is called um, uh, hard health. So you're not in medical health. So moving on, the SPAM Act of 2003 is the one that's probably going to affect you and I the most. This particular act is all about regulating the sending of what is called commercial electronic messages in Australia. That's email, that's SMS, that's instant messages through Facebook, chats, uh, WhatsApp, Kick Messenger, any sort of um, instant messaging apps that there are out there. Now, it applies to emails that originate in Australia and are sent to other people in Australia or anywhere in the world. So we've got some um, some alignment we've done with, um, with international law, which means we don't want to contribute to the global scourge that spam is. So if it originates in Australia, it is subject to the laws of this spam act. It also applies to any email sent from anywhere in the world to a destination in Australia, which you look at it and you go, well, how much spam sits in my Gmail spam box every day? And I'm talking about a couple of hundred a day. What's the government doing about those? In most cases, the government can't do anything about them because they all they do is just rotate email addresses all the time. I get out of that couple of hundred emails, I'll get a, I get a day in my spam box. Um, probably about maybe 50 of them are repeated over and over and over and over. So I'm getting two or three versions of the same thing from different names and different email addresses, usually that are Gmail or Outlook or Hotmail or really weird email addresses that clearly aren't legitimate at all. So what is the government doing about those? Well, they can't really do much about that. What they can do, though, is work with international authorities to really start attacking the people who do cause major damage, particularly with um, malware, with sending scam emails, which are trying to get you to hand over your bank account details, fake ATO um, emails that are sent, that kind of thing. They do work with those. So a lot of that comes from here. But you, as a business in Australia, also are subjected to this. Now, there's no minimum amount of... Um, 
of turnover required. So the national privacy principles have sort of two levels. They've got the level of you as an individual, and then there's um, you as maybe a corporate of $3 million or more with different levels of liability. The SPAM Act is straight across the line for everybody, except for the fining. So individuals who break the SPAM Act, and we'll go into what breaks it in a second, um, can be fined up to $1.5 million, and it can be up to $5 million for organizations. They don't say what size the organizations are. Now, you as an organization would be if you're registered as a company. So if you've got a proprietary limited company, trust, anything like that, you're subjected to the $5 million level. Uh, and this is remember, this is up to now. Nobody really gets fined up to that level unless they're massive corporate companies. You, as a sole trader or as an individual private person, then can get up to one point five million dollars. Either which way, these are big numbers. So even if you've got the smallest possible fine, it's going to hurt. So you want to try and avoid that as much as possible. Now, will it happen to you? There is not a lot of cases of this that happen within Australia every year. Um, there certainly isn't um, a lot of them which are you know, playing about with um, you know, going to court for very petty amounts of, of crime performed on this. So what we look at is go, well, what are the likelihoods that this will happen to you? This is where, for instance, you will have a situation where you collect a lot of personal information, you deal with people's very deep personal details on, on a daily basis, and where people could likely get angry with you. If you work in a place where people could likely get angry with you, this is where you're most at risk because people who get angry can get very vindictive and then use every legal means they can to get back at you. So if you work in an area where it's quite innocuous and, and you're not likely to offend people and cause problems, then this probably will never affect you. But if you do work in somewhere where people may complain and, you know, my father is an example. The great complaint is the older the people get, the more time they've got to spend on, on complaining about things. Uh, that We look at that and go, well, you know what? I might be a little bit of danger at this. So it's just playing a risk game and working out you know, whether you are personally at risk more than what others will be. Like I said before, it accounts for email SMS, what is MMS, which is um, sending pictures, um, memojis, emojis, um sharing videos sharing audio to people's um inboxes on their phones instant messages through facebook messenger uh wechat whatsapp any kind of personal private messaging systems there are the the act covers all of these so it's not just email so ask yourself a few questions again when you go into this just like we did with the with the privacy principles ask yourself did this person opt in to receive these messages if the answer is yes, you're okay. If the answer is no, then you need to sort of move a bit further down and, and try and work out, oh, okay. So if the person did is receiving these messages, yet they didn't expressly opt in to get them, what is my excuse for that? So that's when we'll ask another question further down. Now, the exceptions to these rules are if you're a government body, a registered political party, a charity, or an educational institute um, in the context of sending messages to your current and former students only. So these are the, the only exceptions to this act. I'm assuming that none of you are this in here. You're a small business owner for profit, so you wouldn't actually count as any of these. But the questions you have to ask then is that have you identified yourself? And I'm going to answer that other question a bit more clearly um, very shortly, which about you know, if, if I am collecting this data and they haven't opted in, what is my excuse? Firstly, have you identified yourself? Commercial email and SMS sent must be from an identifiable and contactable person or organization, just like the Privacy Act, right? You've got to identify that this is the company or the person or the individual who's collecting this and here's how I can contact them. Now, the reason that for that is that it identifies that this is the person or the organization at least that's responsible for sending this email. So if I need to respond to it or check up on it, I know who to check on it from. If I get a suspicious email that I can't quite nail down whether it's a fake one or not, if I've got the information of who to contact and where or what, at least what organization to reach out to, I can check on them and say, hey, I just got an email from you guys. I want to check if, if it's legit. And I get it. And it's like, oh, yeah, it's legit. Okay, cool. Thank you for letting me know. And then you can act on that accordingly. So that's why you have to have those pieces of information in there so people can check the legitimacy of it. Are people easily able to unsubscribe? Any sort of commercial email and SMS sent must include a functional way for people to opt out. 
of getting any more messages. So they've got to be able to unsubscribe. That's got to be a part of what you provide. If you're sending them an unsolicited email that's to do with anything commercial, and I will look at what commercial email is in a second, then you have to give them a way out. Um, things like MailChimp, SendInBlue, uh, MailAlight, all, all those different HubSpot, all those different mail programs, they should make this easy for you and allow you to be able to have that automatically built into your email template that's sent out. Usually when you send emails from your um, from your uh, CRM, so if you've got a customer relationship management system like Keep or HubSpot or ClickUp or any of those other ones, if you're sending emails through those, they automatically have an unsubscribe bit at the bottom of the email as it goes out. So people can go, you know, I don't want to receive this anymore. Okay. So what then is classed as a commercial email? What do we call a commercial email that then is subjected to this stuff in the in the act? So in the act, we say the commercial email is anything where you say, hey, I want to sell you something. I've got an offer. I've got a deal. I've got a bargain. I've got a sale. I've got a product. I've got a service. Anything of that type. That gives you the opportunity to, to, anything gives you opportunity to try and sell someone something. That is a commercial email or a commercial SMS. The second one is where you're trying to promote yourself. You're not selling anything, but you're promoting something. You're either promoting yourself as a personal brand, or you're promoting a product, or you're promoting a service that you provide. That is a commercial message sent electronically. So again, email phone, SMS, any of those sort of things. Even voicemail messages are, re are, are regarded as a, um, as a commercial message. What though is not a commercial message? So this is where we get a little bit more complicated. We go, well, okay, I'm still sending them stuff. It's not necessarily promotional. I'm not asking them to buy anything. But, you know, I've got a, I will admit that I'm probably, you know, got some you know, commercial interest in this. But is it actually a commercial message covered by the Act? If you're just reaching out to check in with a, an email to a, a, an existing or a past client, that's not a commercial message. So that's what we call a relationship message. A relationship message or a transactional message. So for instance, someone buys something from your website, you send them then a response to say, hey, your, 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 your parcel's on the way. Here's your tracking number and all that. That's not a um, that's not that's not a commercial message, even though it's part of a commercial process. It's actually what we call a transactional message. So it's something which is to do with the transaction that that customer has with you. So yes, you can send transactional messages with are updating. It can even be something which is a follow up to a transaction that's been completed and delivered. If they've had their scented candle delivered to them, you can then send a follow up message. Say, hey, just checking on your purchase. Can you please uh, leave us a good review? That is also classed as a transactional message because it's directly related to a transaction that someone had with your business. So that's relieving, isn't it? That, that's a good relief. You can actually use those. Now, inside that email, you can include, by the way, did you know you can also blah? So you can um, upsell in that emails, in those transactional emails. You can point to your newsletter and get people to opt in for the newsletter. If again, that's um something you want to do in those transactional emails, but they will not be classed as commercial electronic messages because they're part of the process of your transactions on your website or with your products or services. That's great news. It means you can spruik for people to sign up for a website or sign up for another deal or upsell them to something in a transactional email. Uh, you can also have any communication with someone you already have a relationship with. So if I know somebody, I've got them on my email list that I, I've dealt with them. They might be a colleague, a friend, a family member. I can actually include those in an email list because they know who I am and they have a relationship with me. We have a prior association. This is the big workaround and loophole that comes in the Spam Act of 2003. You can say, I've got thousands of people who I've chatted to in my life who are in my list of emails, my Gmail account. Surely I can use those for my email list. Yeah, you can because you have a provable and demonstrable relationship with them already. Even if you've only had one email with them, or if you've only had one message with them, from them or to them, you've got a prior relationship with them. That's a great thing, because that allows us then to grow our mail lists much bigger than just growing them from scratch. You've got that loophole. It allows you to say, yes, I've dealt with this person before, therefore, 
This is a relationship email. I have a demonstrable, provable record of my relationship with them before. Even if it was just one email, you've got that relationship. So what this means then for you building your email and contact lists is that, yes, you can dip into your existing contacts and add them to an email list. First of all, though, you cannot buy a list of contacts from someone else, a third party, a lead generation company, either, and just start messaging them because you don't have the prior relationship with them, do you? And you still have to explain to them at some point why they're receiving this email. You'll see it on quite a lot of emails. You were receiving this email because you opted in to receive newsletters from this person, or you have a prior relationship with this person. You'll often see it on the bottom of corporate emails and sent out to people, sale emails that are sent out from the places you shop at. I get it in my Kmart email. It immediately then gives me the option to opt in, opt out, change my preferences, all that at the bottom of the email. I can manage that for myself. What you do not do is buy lists from others. The exception to this is that you buy a business that comes with a list and you integrate that into your bigger list for your bigger business. That is allowed because you own the business now that they had the relationship with. So whilst they have had not had a relationship with you or your current business name, they've had a relationship with one of your subsidiaries or they've had a relationship with the business that you've now absorbed and owned. So you can add those to your list as well. So that's probably the one exception you can look at where you are getting a list from someone else. Now, I started off with an email list of about 150 people that I was able to go, okay, these are people who I've expressly had some kind of response or opt-in from. But then once I added my full list of contacts from people who have had a relationship through me uh, at some point in the last 10 years, that list grew up to well over 2,500. Today, it's 10,500. So it's something which you can grow by adding in lists, but you can't go and buy these lists from lead generation companies. That's a big no-no. You can add your existing contacts, yes, I've said that, to a newsletter or to a mailing list. So as long as you say you're receiving this because at the bottom of the email. So my one does it. It always has that at the end of it where you're, you're receiving this because you were subscribed to this list. And they go, okay, well, I don't want to be subscribed to that list until they'll unsubscribe. So out of that 10,500, I might get like seven or eight unsubscribes a week, something, something like that. So which is a pretty good percentage um, because it's I, I would get equally that many people signing up for the newsletter. So it doesn't the list doesn't drop anything. It just kind of stays the same or grows a little bit more every week. You should provide an explanation why people are getting those messages. So like I said, at the bottom of the email, you are receiving this because you are subscribed to this list. So you're receiving this because you're a customer of, or you're receiving this because you have had previous contact with me, that kind of thing. So once you provide that, now you should provide, you don't actually have to by law um, provide the details, the granular details where I say, oh, you're receiving this because you know Dante St. James and have had previous contact with him. You can just say something that says at the very least, you're receiving this because you are subscribed to this email list. And then they can self-manage that email list from there. But you must provide an easy and functional way for people to unsubscribe themselves or get themselves off that contact list. That's where you see the unsubscribe links at the bottom of all these emails. They allow you to not receive anything more if you choose to not receive any more. You cannot have convoluted things of, oh, just call our call center and we'll take you off. You've got to have something. If you've added people automatically, you must have a way that lets them remove themselves automatically. That's just ethical. That's not even in the law. That's just an ethical way of doing it. And MailChimp, MailAlight, and SendInBlue, and HubSpot, and all the email sending systems that are out there all have that functionality because all the, the laws around the world around spam are pretty much lined up with each other. Every country has their version of the Spam Act of 2003. So you just got to make it easy for them to do it. It can be email, uh, just send me an email and I'll remove you from the list. That can be done. It's simple. It's easy. Might not be automated, but you can say with Within 24 hours, you'll be removed. But these days, there's no real reason for that when the systems will do all that for you. So as we reach the end of this, I know there's been a lot of legal schmeagle talk going on, a lot of stuff that you're going, oh, how does this apply to me? If you've got any questions before we go, please whack them in the Q&A or the webinar chat, but I'll give you a few wrap-up thoughts. Please only collect the information you really need about your clients. Don't go collecting all the information there is. Just because you can get it doesn't mean you should have it. Be prepared to disclose what you hold to your clients because they have the right to demand what you hold about them and have that sent to them. 
understand what commercial messaging is and what non-commercial messaging is. Remember commercial messaging is about offers, products, services, deals, um, you uh, promoting yourself, marketing, that's all commercial messaging. But transactional messages, which are responses to things that people have already done with your business, are not commercial messages. Neither are you reaching out to someone who you haven't spoken to in ages, who you decide to go, hey, I thought you might be interested in this. That's not a commercial message. That's regarded as a relationship message. And build those lists mindfully and ethically. Don't go buying lists from people. Build it. You're better off building a slow list with a very high open rate rather than having a list of 10,500 people and only having 8% of people opening those emails. So build it mindfully. Be purposeful about it. And, and a personal piece of advice I do here, once you've got a big list, regularly clean the thing out. Most email systems will do that for you. I know that my one, um, MailerLite, uh, sorry, um, Send in Blue, which is what I use. MailChimp does it. MailerLite does it. Um, Active Campaign does it. It says if this person hasn't opened up an email three times in a row, if you sent them three weeks of emails and you haven't opened it, don't send them the next one. So that's how I reduce down the amount of people that are on my list who are active. And then what I might do later on is I'll add that person back in to see if they're interested again now. Or you might get those emails from places like Business Business Station does this with their emails. They'll send out a thing and say, okay, we haven't, you haven't opened these emails in a while. Um, we just check in if you still want to receive this. If you don't, that's okay. We'll take you off it. So you respond yes or no, and they'll take you off. Or you go, yes, they'll send you the next one and you'll read it. So it's just like a check-in just to say, hey, you're still there. Personally, I think they're a great idea. Um, it, it reminds people that you exist. It doesn't send them an email list email. It sends them a very short, sharp email that should get through spam filters. So yeah, just be careful with your lists. Don't go too far aboard, up, up, overboard with it. So as we go into 2023 now full scale, you might think, well, I'm ready to start working more on this sort of stuff. So you can do that uh, through the Digital Solutions Program. If you haven't used your three hours already, you can sign up for three one-hour sessions of individual one-to-one -one coaching. Um, you can have then four or more hours of all our workshops and webinars for $44. Now, this particular program ends at the end of March. So if you haven't used it yet, I do encourage you to get in there and use it. And yes, Jan, that email program is called Send in Blue. That's exactly what it's called. So sendinblue.com will take you through there. So the one I use, um, I personally like it because number one, it's cheap. And number two, it's um, it's it's fairly simple to use. It's not a complex program to use. It's got a lot of built-in stuff that's included in the basic price as well. If you want to go on with the digital solutions program, digitalsolutions.businessstation.com.au. Long, long address, isn't it? But it makes sense. Digital solutions, the program, business station, the company, .com .au. Thank you so much for taking some time out this morning. We've got a 12-minute early mark. Reach out on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, any of those things. Email if you want to ask me any questions about this. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I hope you have a great week and may all the decisions you make in marketing and your business be wise ones. Have a great week.